Hey guys, welcome back to the New Nine podcast and YouTube channel. I'm your host, Brandon Cubitt, and today we have a super unique interview that we actually have our very first guest host. So our guest host today is someone that I'm good buddies with that I met on the golf course, and he is um, arguably, you know, he's in the conversation for the GOAT, the greatest of all time as far as CFL quarterbacks go, Bo Levi Mitchell. So Bo Levi obviously plays for the Stampeders. Hall of Fame career, and he's a huge golf head. So he's someone that I golf with all the time in the summer. And uh, the guest that we're bringing on is one of the highest demand putter makers there are, Tyson Lamb. So Tyson Lamb is someone that sent me my own putter about two years ago, and uh, his products are in just such high demand. So in playing golf with Bo, he obviously saw my putter. He's from Texas. Tyson's from Texas, and he wants this putter so bad. So I thought, hey, let's bring both of these guys on the podcast. We can talk some golf, talk some putters, and uh, obviously them being from Texas, they have that connection as well. Okay, before we throw it over to the interview, I need all of you watching to do me a huge favor and just hit that subscribe button. Without that subscribe button, YouTube doesn't realize that we're pumping out really good content and you guys watching have such a big impact. Please hit the subscribe button. So now let's throw it over to our interview with our co-host, Bo Levi Mitchell and Tyson Lamb. Tyson, where are y'all located at in Texas? Uh, well, we're in Plano. I don't know what part you're oh, okay. in. Okay. Well, I'm from I'm from Katy, oh, nice. uh, but I, I'm in Calgary as well. I play I play football up here now, so I played at Katy High School and then played at SMU in Dallas, and now I'm up here. Yeah, we uh, I actually went to Allen, so we played Katy. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know Allen well. So you guys, I know, are so busy with building this new shop. Tell me a little bit about that process. Where are you guys at? What's going on with the new shop? Well, I mean, we're sitting in it right now, so we're we're actually in mom's office. If uh, I'll, I'll turn the camera here, here's kind of a view out, outside of her office. So you can obviously see the sizzler sitting there, but we got a row of machines, and then over here we got paint and shipping, and then just a bunch of storage. And then if I walk out, I mean, it's it's we're moving in. So, but here's the uh, flip around. This is kind of the the storefront right here where it's all open. So we'll have a simulator here and a big retail area over here to the left um we're technically still under construction but we've got a lot of stuff in so there'll be a bar and a hangout area here and then this will be a glass door so everything overlooks the shop so basically we can uh kind of have the retail and the hangout portion separate and then everything kind of opens up if we have an event or whatever and then um here i'll walk you upstairs real quick go upstairs a true true texas man you got a bar in the uh the workplace i like it <laughs> yeah we uh we couldn't we couldn't get it done before we got our our occupancy right. but we're, we're working on it so up here there'll be putting green a hangout area and then everything kind of overlooks the front so this will be a pretty sweet kind of panoramic once it's done and then back here everything overlooks the shop that is so cool so it's it's pretty sweet you got a couple offices over there balcony um, and we got about, uh, one second. where'd we go? Am I there? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, we got you. Oh, I touched them. Uh, we've got another half acre or so behind it to where we can put putting green in. And if we want to have food trucks or something, we could, we could do it. So it's pretty cool. The, uh, the railroad tracks actually run. The dart runs right here next to our shop. And then downtown Plano's over there. So it's it's a pretty it's a pretty sweet location as far as, Getting here, I don't know how many you know, times a month we'll be open to the public, but it's uh, it's a pretty sweet spot. Was it an existing building or did you guys yeah, build everything so, from scratch? So uh, it was a, an auto parts store built in 1987. It wasn't for sale. Um, the, the guy who who had it, we kind of just fought you know, tooth and nail with him to get it. Um, at first he didn't want to sell it. And then luckily we we kind of showed him, you know, what we wanted to do and explain our story. And I think he had a little bit of, uh, you know, stuff in common with us and we ended up getting it and then it would turn into a 15 month project from hell. Um, so it's, it's been fun. We've learned a lot, but it's, it's a lot better looking than, um, I guess the process looked as a whole. Everyone's like, it's so great. You know, it looks awesome. It looks sick, whatever. And I'm just like, if you only knew. Being a machinist, is there things that you're building within the shop or is it a lot of contractors doing that type of stuff? Oh, I mean, we've, uh, I think, what's, what month is it? Is that October? Yeah. So <laughs> February or March, I kind of just quit everything and came over here and we had to kind of get hands on. There was a lot of stuff that wasn't getting done 
to the way that we wanted it. And then me being me, I kind of just got in. We, we've done everything from like handrails to storefront to concrete work to woodwork. I mean, yesterday we were building a workbench for shipping. There's all, I mean, windows, we were reglazing windows. There's all sorts of stuff that we kind of started doing. Um, but we're, we're far from done. So as we start going and, and, um, start making parts again, potters, whatever you want to say, we'll, we'll probably have a you know, project here and there every week or two where we've got something going on. We don't have the sim in, we don't have the bar in. There's a lot of things that have to get done, for, you know, till we feel like we're finished, but just getting in the building has been, our, you know, a process in itself. So that was kind of the number one most important thing. Get in and let's get back to, back to work and take care of the other stuff after. Cause it's already way better than what we had before. Do you guys have a tentative open date? With COVID and the city and all that, I don't think so. Originally, it was what October, October fifteenth or sixteenth. Yeah, but <laughs> I think depending upon the weather and all that, we'll have some type of opening event. Um, we're kind of just at the mercy of one, the weather, two, what the city allows, and then three, just kind of where we are in production wise and all that. It'd be kind of stupid, I think, to do something around Christmas just because that's usually our busiest time. So if we have to push it this spring, we will. But um, something I think we'll do for sure is once we kind of get stuff going, I think it'd be smart to do like an e-tour or whatever where I can go on live on Instagram or something and just kind of, you know, answer questions, do whatever. But eventually we'll have fittings and, and those types of things. But I think now for the time being, it's smart for us to just kind of keep the door shut until we get our stuff established and all that. Just from, you know, if I was like, hey, come by the shop. I'm like, yeah, I'll be here half an hour. You, you'll be here for a couple hours. You know, it's it's one of those things that it's not, it's not just a spend 10 minutes and leave type thing. And, and then mom too, will will keep you tied up talking, talking to you and asking you questions and all that. So that, that's half the battle. It's just not, not having to talk to her for a long time. <laughs> that's so nice of you. I mean, it, 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 you're easy to talk to. So I have awesome. a lot of good friends out there. You sure do. You're such a natural conversationalist, Tana. Every time I talk on the phone with you, I expect it to be two minutes and it turns into 20 minutes. I mean, yeah. she's like part-time psychiatrist too. <laughs> so That's I can that. imagine, you know, obviously uh, the want and the demand for your putters is at an all-time high, especially with this new shop building. Um, but it was a perfect example that wants one of your putters so bad. And I keep telling them, look, man, it, it, you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait. What's kind of the process? What's the turnaround as far as getting someone like Bo, you know, someone that's on the wait list, a putter? So I think um, it, it's kind of sort it's a it's a tough subject, but I think you know, mom's got a, a slew of people that have been waiting for X, X amount of time. Actually, she probably knows more about it than I do. But I think the, the end all be all is once we can take care of the stuff that, that has been in queue for so long that we're going to have to kind of start with a clean slate and have a better process to where, you know, we, we might upset some people who've been waiting a long time, but if we don't kind of wipe the slate clean, I think it's, it's going to be a, a, a it's going to be a process that never gets taken care of. So by starting fresh and, and getting someone um, you know, realistic expectations on what we can actually deliver is going to be number one, but two, just eliminating some of these crazy ideas that we've said yes to, you know, they take forever. And if I tell you five months, well, I may not know what's going to happen in that time frame. And if, and if you want a one-off shape that, you know, it's going to take me two, three, four days just to get it ready to, to make. And I do one and then we're done. It kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. Not that we won't do that, but I think just getting the people that are after that realistic expectations, you know, that's, that's key. And then trying to come up with a system that, you know, for, for Bo, if, if I say, all right, Bo, what do you want? And you have, you have a list of shapes that you can get a list of options. And then, you know, you can give me some inspiration. We do something, you know, custom on a couple aspects of the build, but it's not fully a hundred percent, you know, one off um, custom. I think I can, you know, we can deliver something. I'd like to get to six to eight weeks if possible, which I think is a realistic time frame. But you know, I don't want to keep doing the hey, I want you to I want you to build this. Here's a blank sheet of paper, draw what you want, because it would just it just is not it's not realistic, you know. And so that's where we're going, is we're working on a process now where we can get something, you know, in queue, give you some options, uh, and then get your take on what it is, and then I'll take and run with it rather than allowing so many people just kind of tell us what we want, you wouldn't hire Picasso and tell them what to do. Not saying that I'm Picasso, but much, it's much easier to um, hire, you know, or commission us to build you something and give us a little bit of creative freedom. And that actually makes it faster and easier for me to do. So standardizing that process is, is what we're trying to do. Uh, how soon that'll be done. 
I'm not sure, but uh, you know, we're trying to get to where at the beginning of next year we can kind of hit the ground rolling and and start you know taking orders. And then once they stack up again, I guess time will tell on how you know how strong we can deliver and all that. And hopefully it doesn't get backed up the way it's been. Oh, do you got an idea of the shape of uh, lamb putter you want? Well, I mean, uh, I've looked at all your gallery. I've looked at everything you've done. And I think exactly what you just said with Picasso is my take on it perfectly. Is I, I was I was more of the sense of I, I just wanted to hand you the idea, tell you that I'm, I'm from Katy. You know, I'm from Texas. I love everything about it. I miss it being up here in Canada. Um, and the one thing I love is all the, the donut shapes you have with, like, the coin, the, uh, the ball markers and everything. Because uh, if you ever came up here, Tyson, Tana, the donuts do not compare. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not even close. Like they're all frozen. They, they warm them up. There's no ship leaves. Like there's nothing like that, that, uh, sure. that, uh, compares. So yeah, I would say, uh, I, I was going to let you just go crazy and do something, whatever you wanted to do. And that's what I was excited about. What's the, uh, what's the big coffee chain up there? Um, Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons. They don't have good donuts. I think they're <laughs> decent, but I've never had a Texas donut, so I can't compare. I'm going to get, ro- I'm going to get roasted for saying that, but no, they don't. Uh, do you guys have pigs in a blanket or kolaches? It depends on what you call them. No, they don't. <laughs> yeah, like the kolache factory, everything. Man, that's – you're breaking my heart right now. <laughs> the, the best part about, about seeing donut shops here is seeing the name. Like, there's a new one that just opened on the street. It's just called Donut. Like, no S. Just, it just says Donut. And then there's there's one that's like Sunny's Donuts and down the street. I mean, there's – Max, is, like everybody has it, it just says like Max's Donuts or whatever, but you, you pretty much know what you're getting into when you go on a donuts out here. Oh, yeah. And that's probably why we're all a little bit bigger than we should be down there in Texas. So <laughs> it makes sense. Is that where the inspiration of the donuts came from? Is it a pretty big cultural thing in Texas? No, I think um, originally it was the Happy Gilmore Cracker and then it kind of just turned into Drive to Show Puff for Donuts. But I, I thought it'd be really funny to just take a full size donut and actually mark your ball. And then it turned into actually, it was a year long. I had, I had the idea of a year before we actually made one. And then we, uh, mom was taken at, at that time, we didn't have a website or anything. And, uh, mom would take, I mean, you could tell what you had to do for, for an order. Oh yeah. People, people would email and I would send them an invoice and then they would have to PayPal or physically give me a credit card. Then I'd have to match them up. Then we'd go produce whatever it was, and then I manually did the label, and then I manually drove it to the post office. I mean, I, I did everything by hand. Like you oh, could, man. you could, if, if on a good day, we could probably ship like twenty five or something. It oh, was, it was it was crazy. It was. You crazy. were painting them too, weren't you? Yes. Do you still paint them? Um, not so much anymore. I do some of them, and usually. The, the last one I think Tyson did, but usually I'll go in when we have a new donut, I'll go in and just get all the paints out and just sit and paint all day, which I'd like to do with the next one and pick out the next combo. Hmm. And picking the combo is more difficult than what you can imagine because Tyson has his ideas. I have my ideas. And between both of us, we come up with something but like the original four donuts, there were only supposed to be two. Mm. And that, so it got to the point I wanted the red, white, and blue, <laughs> and I wanted the pink and white. And then Tyson wanted the turquoise and black. And then, so yeah, so we, <laughs> we couldn't decide. And it was, you know, getting to be a really big debate. So I said, let's just do all four of them. And that's what we did. And so we put, when we, the reason we're explaining the order thing, whenever we went from doing manual orders because people would complain because we couldn't ship anything fast enough and it took forever. So we built a website and the only thing that we had on it was donuts. We didn't have potters. We didn't have anything. We had some galleries, stuff like that, but we launched our, our Landcraft website with only donuts. And it was like the first time we ever sold out, but that was like the turning point where we put, we, you know, got Shopify and ShipStation and we automated our shipping process and people didn't, you know, they could go on and type their stuff in. We didn't have to, you know, email back and forth and all of that. Um, it was actually during the world series when the Cubs won, it was game seven. And we thought we'd sell like 50 of them. I think I made 50 and we sold like, I don't know, 500 or something like that. And wow. there was, yeah, it was, it was pretty staggering. We, we didn't realize how crazy it was going to be. And then it kind of went, 
for us, maybe viral on social media, but it, I mean, it, it wasn't viral, but for, for us, it was definitely big. And then it just became a thing. It's like, who the hell doesn't like donuts? So it never intended to be that way. It just, it just happened. Since the original donuts, you guys have had a ton of other accessories, head covers, and obviously putters that have blown up the secondary market. Does it bug you that the stuff that you've created sold for your list price is selling for two, three, four, sometimes 10 times what you originally sold it for? I'll let you answer this one first and then I'll give my attention. <laughs> no, I mean, it's showing you there, that there's demand. And at first it was kind of tough because, you know, you, you go through a lot of, you know, heartache and work making something special for somebody just for them to sell it. And, and that, you know, kind of makes you feel like you gave somebody a Christmas present and then they realized they could get more money for it and they sold it. So, so it kind of hurt. But once you kind of put it into perspective, then you can say, hey, yes, we made this. Yes, we made our money off of it, um, it, which is good. I mean, that's, we set a price and that's what we sell it for. But it shows us that the demand is there. And one thing that eBay has done, even though it's helped people to make money, I mean, we, we do help some people make their mortgage payment, things like that, and they've told us that. But eBay has actually brought us more customers. Because they'll look and they'll be like, oh my gosh, $100 for a ball marker or 200 or whatever. What in the world is this? And then they go and Google us and they see what we're doing and then we get a new customer out of it. So it's, you know, there's pros and cons to the secondary market. But I would say for the most part, as long as 80% of our sales go to people that really want them, then the 20% actually help us as well that sell their products. I think uh, there, there was one time someone told a story to mom and I'll, I'll catch glimpses or I'll hear stories. There's, there's all sorts of stops or there's all sorts of excuses, especially if, uh, if you get caught have, you know, putting something up for sale before we even ship it, she will literally figure it out. She'll call you make you feel like an idiot and it's entertaining to hear what the other person has to say. But there was one time that we stamped something. It was um, survivor. And the guy's story was like, my daughter survived cancer. You know, can you stamp this on this or whatever? And we're like, of course, like anything that we could do like that, we always try to do. And then, you know, within a day of getting it, it was on eBay for like a thousand bucks. And you're just like, nothing. I don't think anything really surprises me anymore. Uh, I think, it goes two ways. One, when you buy something, you know, if you buy something and you, you know for a fact that you can get your money back from it and it's a secure investment, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a Walmart or a putter, a watch, whatever. Uh, once you become collectible, I think it's a different expectation. So I think it's perceived in a different way. So it helps us when some people just buy stuff. If we release it, they don't even have to see it because they know that we're not going to be making X, you know, thousands of products and, and pump it out there. And they know that if they don't like it or they don't want it or hell, if, if there's a rainy day and they need to sell it, I mean, they could make two, three, 10 times their you know, money. There's been very few products. I think that I've seen on the secondary market that if any, that don't bring, you know, the same value. It depends, you know, whenever I used to collect and sell putters and all of that too, usually you can move a product two to three times and then eventually it kind of catches up to you. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of other brands in, in golf that, um, you know, you buy something and you don't have any value and it's not discrediting them by any means, but it, it's been really cool to become collectible and it wasn't intentional. It just it kind of happened, you know? And, and I think uh, for me personally, it, it goes to the story. So if, if I talk to you and you and I work for two or three hours on something and it means a lot to you and I make it for you and you sell it, yeah, it doesn't feel great. Like if your kid colored you a picture and then you sold it, he probably wouldn't be happy. Not that that's, the same thing, but it's, it's a good analogy. And I think there's certain situations where, um, you know, guys are like, well, you know, I, I got into gambling trouble or, or my wife didn't like it and I sold it or whatever. And I'm like, you know, just if, if I, if we know you well enough and just communicate, don't bullshit us. It's, it's so funny to see the stories in the, and even with like the sneaker guys who don't even play golf, mom, uh, mom called a guy one time and was like, Oh, you just bought this, yada yada yada. Where do you play golf? And he names, of course. He's like, "What's your handicap?" And didn't he say like thirty nine A or one thirty nine A? I think is what this he guy's told handicap me. was one thirty nine A. Yes, and then I and then I asked him about the course that he played at, if it was public or private, 
And he said, oh my gosh, it is so private. They don't even have a sign, nothing. I mean, you can't even find it. So he didn't know and, the name of it. Yeah, and he, he kept convincing me, you know, to sell him this product, which I already knew. I found him on one of the, the sites where we were a target. And so he convinced me to ship it. I said, okay, I'll ship it. And then he gets on his site. I get a screenshot of it. And he said, what is she? The CIA? You know, the Secret Service? But I got her. I got her. She's shipping it. And he used some other choice words, which I won't say there. And I called in to um, FedEx. I called the package back. Mm -hmm. And then he called me and he said, Tana, it looks like the package that you said you were going to send me, you know, is coming back to you. And I said, yes, it is. And you didn't get me. And he's like, oh, how do you know this? And then he goes back on the forum and says, she's got some kind of rat in here. <laughs> you know, and it, was, it was rather comical because it's like, just tell me the truth if I ask you a question. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. It's not like we're going to prevent you from uh, buying something. But at that particular release, we already knew that we were a target. And I did see... Um, that they were trying to get 80% of our products from the website. Wow. And they already had their price that they were gonna put it on eBay and that's exactly what they did. So I held on to their money for like 30 days. And I would say I caught about 75% of them because they weren't even our customers. They, they were kids that were in college or in high school that were doing it. Yeah, I mean, I think to, to summarize your question, if um, we talked to, I would say 65 to 70% of our customers. We talk to 95% of our repeat customers. I mean, th I think all the time, there's not many things that go unnoticed as far as, you know, if, if you have something from me and you send us a picture, I can tell if I did it. I can tell, I can probably tell you when I did it. I probably got a picture in my phone. I mean, like we, we do our due diligence on making sure that people, you know, are buying and reselling and, you know, taking care of their investment. And that's, that's huge. But it does hurt, I think, when when you spend a lot of time or you spend a lot of energy and you have a good relationship and either that relationship ends or you you know they have other stuff going on in their life. I mean, it, it's it's a personal the Potter world is a really personal thing and um, it's it's good and bad. I think it's really hard to try to standardize and try to you know like if if you want something special for me, I would love to do it. But if I make something special for you, then. Felix or whoever else who doesn't get it may be upset and they'd be like, well, well I'm selling all of my stuff or, or whatever. And it's, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of personal um, input that goes into it and, and guys get upset and you just have to kind of figure out how to walk the line. I think if I, if we didn't have mom, it, it would be totally different because I can't be making stuff and, you know, taking care of all of that too. At one point maybe, but it, it's gotten so, I don't want to say so big, but it's just gotten so hard to manage my own life. And then, be able to, you know, create relationships and products all at the same time. So we have mom and Addison and, and Addison could talk to you a little less than mom can as far as the, she's more of a, I'll send you an email, we'll get it done. And, and mom wants to hear about everything in your life going on. And, and that's also how sometimes we could talk people off the ledge because they got upset that so-and-so bought something and they didn't get to. So, it, you know, it's, it's a five way street when it comes to that, but it's part of it. And I'm thankful that we're collectible and I know mom is too. And, and it also allows us to get to know people, which is probably the most fun part about our job. That's wicked. Bo, have you ever had someone trying to profit off of your celebrity or do you have people waiting outside the bus that just want your autograph? They're going to flip it on eBay. So oh, it's uh, it's actually something that happens a lot. Um, so literally we'll get off the bus and, and there will be people there with jerseys and helmets and my, you know, Katie high school Jersey and uh, they'll sign it, but they only ever sign in blue. And I'm like, I, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I caught on, obviously. Same people kept coming back, coming back. Oh, it's for my grandchild. It's for this person. It's for this person. So I started scouring the sites. I looked at eBay. Virage sale is one up here. Uh, Let go is one of the new ones. And then um, find, and I couldn't find anything. I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe they are being realistic and they're actually giving these to the kids. There's like a, uh, like a black marketplace up here, just like a market that they sell stuff out of tents. I go there one day and they have all of our stuff, all these Stampeder things, all for sale. So um, yeah, we were, uh, so we stopped signing things for them. But one thing I will say, man, being in demand is a hell of a thing. 
You know what I mean? It's uh, it's exciting to be that way. Like I, I'm a Jordan collector. Um, you know, I, I'm one of those shoe guys you talk about. Um, I've got 60 pairs. I've never sold a pair. It's just one of those things that I, I keep for pride and I love. But uh, yeah, I definitely can understand with you guys, you know, having a story and somebody telling you, well, help me make this putter. And you spend, you know, how many weeks you spend with them to create that putter. And all of a sudden you see it up on eBay. It's like a slap in the face. So one thing I can tell you is, you know, Tiger just sold his backup putter. Yeah, uh, and it had that little spot on there. You can tell he did a golf ball a thousand times. Whenever I get a Tyson Land putter, it will be in my bag until the day I die. So I'm <laughs> I'm excited to get it, and uh, you know, no matter how long it takes, I mean, I'm I'm pumped. So uh, it'll be fun. Well, well so yeah. do you not have? Do you guys not have like an auction house or an autograph house or, or memorabilia shop that you're like partnered with that handles a lot of that stuff for you? Or no, um, I mean, I don't. I would never. I, 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 I give my autograph away for free, right? So I would never right. you know, try to profit off of it. So if other people are doing it, like you said, like that's the one way my wife uh, explained it to me, my mom being a Texas mom, just like tan over there. Um, she said, hey, if somebody has to sell something of yours to you know keep a roof over their head, like you should feel proud of that. Uh, you, you've given away your autograph for free your whole life. Why chain now? So, um, you know, we're not, we're not NFL guys or anything. What's that? Be careful with what you sign. I mean, like, some pros don't sign golf balls. I mean, if, if somebody had this big mural, mural with 67 things all over it, and, and you could basically tell that it, it was going to, to be for sale somewhere, you, you're, I'm sure you see what you're signing. That, that. Yeah. So yeah. You this for fun, but you're not ignorant about it, obviously. Yeah. The ones that get me are the guys that walk up with, uh, you know, a binder full of cards. And they're like, hey, you sign these, you know, 40 cards. I'm like, why would I sign the exact same card for you 10 times? Like, I'll sign one of each. That's why I sell them every time. Like I'll sign one of each of them so you can keep them. But like, I'm not going to sit here and just, you know, give you a, a profit for your entire life. You got to get your wife to start a, uh, a black market of your own stuff. <laughs> there you go. That's smart. <laughs> I mean, until they figure we've thought about it so many times and just all the, it's hard to sell the most unique stuff. I think if it, it's awesome to be able to make it, but it's really hard to decide who gets it or how you sell it because it's never fair. And lotteries are no fun and, and drawings are no fun. Like someone's always mad, but we've been trying to figure out a way to, to where we could take and create like an auction house or a secondary market doing it ourselves to where you know that it's authentic. But at the same time, it's just, it's a lot of work. It, it takes more time to sell that unique one item um, object than it does to sell 10 or 20 of something that's consistent. So I think what for us, like the shop will be a really cool space to have unique things or whatever. So if you come in or anybody comes to visits, you know, we have, some things that you can't get online or you can't get wherever. And then, you know, it's just like, well, he came to visit or he came for this release here or whatever. I think it's, it'll be kind of a cool tool for us to be able to, to release the, the game worn Jersey, so to speak, you know what I mean? Like the unique thing that you only have a couple of, because how do you, you know, how do you decide who gets it? It's tough. Yeah. Tyson, people compare you to Scotty Cameron. Does it bug you? Does it annoy you? How does it feel to be compared to Scotty? I think at first I, I hated it. Um, and one of the hardest things about being an artist or being in this industry is you're like, why would people buy something with my name on it? But it allowed me to be a little more creative and uh, kind of do whatever, whether I was doing a remodel on a house or building a workbench or a putter, if I just put my name on it, then it's art. It doesn't necessarily matter what it is. So that, that freed me up there. As far as speaking towards Scotty, he obviously single-handedly created the collector market pretty much in golf, I would say. So it's definitely flattering. I rolled a camera for, 10 plus years before I, I made my own. So I, I'm, I'm savvy in, in a lot of Scotty stuff. Uh, I think if you don't follow him or whatever, you're probably not necessarily a customer of ours. It's uh, it's kind of a common thing across the board, but um, he's definitely on a different level as far as, you know, I don't think we'll, we'll ever get to the, the business numbers that they do. And this, the things that he does are staggering and he's backed by a big company, which, you know, is, is awesome. I, I definitely think it's a compliment. Um, I, uh, I pride myself on my finish work and that's probably the number one thing that I do uh, as far as my skill set goes. And, and he's definitely one of the best finishers Him with NTP mills are probably the two I would look up to for putter finishing. Um, I don't, I don't know. I kind of just play it off. If someone says something, I I'd just rather be known for me, you know, uh, initially uh, people asked me to do a bunch of stuff like him and, and I kind of bought into it for a little while, but then once I started doing my own unique things, it definitely made me feel a lot better about what I was doing. So um, definitely respect the hell out of the guy. And, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's pretty cool to be associated in the same sentence, but you know, I'm trying to kind of make my own way and do things the way that I want to be known for, you know, long, long term. 
Have you guys ever crossed paths? Have you guys ever talked or been face to face? So, yes. Funny uh, story. <laughs> yes, I, I'm not. I'm not going to tell a story. Um, <laughs> It, it was, I was nervous. I went up and introduced myself at the PGA show to him. Uh, we talked for quite a bit. Someone asked uh, if they could take a picture of us and he didn't want to take a picture. And that's kind of how the conversation ended, but I uh, told him how much I appreciated what he's done. Talk shop for a little bit. Um, you know, he shared, he shared something with me. I said, I don't know how you do it, you know, cause I see why, you know, Scotty is, is secretive and protective and all of that and how they do things because I mean, you can get hurt and it, and it's hard to trust people in, in the collector world. So I totally get it. I don't know how he does it on, on the level that he has done, but um, I told him, I said, I don't know how you do it. He said, well, a true professional makes it look easy. I'll never forget that. And I mean, there, there's a certain extent to it, but I think um, it's not easy. And, you know, I, the, what I took from that is, you know, he, in the beginning of his career, he definitely um, was at the helm a lot more. He did a lot of the work, you know, he didn't have a big crew and a big OEM behind him. And that's, that's kind of where we're at, you know, so I feel like I've put in, you know, as much time and effort as, as we possibly can. And, you know, I would say to him that at one point there was no way it was considered easy, but I'll never forget when he told me that because to this day still, I'm like, you don't get into putters to make money, you know, you get lucky and you make money, but Butter makers work their ass off and you're, you're not doing this to, you know, to have a huge retirement. You're doing it because you love it and, and all that. Shop, I just turned off. But yeah, it, it was pretty cool. I've, I've talked to him once and then obviously there's been back and forth um, through the collectors and, and all of that, but total admiration for the guy. And, and he's definitely made, you know, paved the way for what we're doing. So I appreciate what he's done. I wish we had a copy of that picture. I feel like it'd be like Superman looking at Batman. It'd be a meme that would blow up the uh, oh. our world. Honestly, it might just be two super preppy looking guys smiling and everyone made fun of us, but the picture didn't get taken. So um, his his social media guy was there and he had a meeting to go to. So I, I don't blame him. It's it's OK. I guess if one of these other up and coming guys came along, I mean, I, I'd be like, sure. You want to use my welding table? Come on. Like, that's me, though. I'm like, here, here here's what I'm doing. I'm going to run up the middle. If you, you, you know, have a problem, just stop us. It's kind of the way we are. We, we kind of open our doors to everything. The last question that I have for you guys is I was telling you the new nine brand, the new nine podcast is about learning from mistakes that it's come from shooting 50 on the front, 36 on the back. You know, you find the sand, you find the water, you learn from those mistakes. New nine is that motivation to have a good back nine. Um, it also, you know, golf, such a reflection on life that there's so many ups and downs, good breaks, bad breaks. And we're just, uh, you know, a combination of all the bad stuff that's happened to us. Really. Can you think of a new nine experience that you've had in life or in business that, you know, you've been beaten up, kicked down, but but uh, you prevailed and obviously found some positives. We, uh, then 2015, I think we took on a project and, uh, it was to make motorcycle parts and, uh, it was a super big PO and it turned into be a, a big R and D project. It was like a four month deal and we didn't have any money. And I was, we were in their garage at the time. And so I thought this, it was supposed to be like a $75,000 deal and we were going to make, running boards and all sorts of parts for Harleys. And they were for a, a local uh, motorcycle shop, spent all this time and money and energy prototyping everything. And then basically they took it um, to another shop to get it done. So we went four months and we didn't charge them hardly anything up front, virtually nothing. And we never got paid for it. And I think um, I remember there was, there was a time we were overdrawn and I had a bunch of bills to pay and I didn't have the money. And, uh, our current business partner at the time who who's helped us, you know, do a lot of stuff. Mom had to get on the phone. Uh, she was handling the bills that we had to do. And we had a purchase order for a golf tournament uh, that we couldn't buy the material for. Basically she had to just ask him for some money and we got it, got through it obviously. But after that, we weren't making parts for anybody else anymore. Like we were done. Like that was like the learning point. We wanted people to respect what we did and, and, you know, we could get paid for something that we love to do. And people appreciated the work. It wasn't a, um, you know, the, the F you mentality because they just ran over us and, and we learned, you know, so um, I, I think that, and I think figuring out, um, figuring out who actually genuinely cares about you versus, you know, if, if you quit, whatever it is that you're doing, who's going to still be calling, who's going to be around. I think learning that, um, it is key in, in anything that you do, but um, it, it's also part of starting a small business. And if you have an idea or something that you want to do, I mean, I think we can attest to it, you know, 
figure out how to do it and go try to do it. And you can always go work for someone else, you know? So that's been kind of our mentality, jump and find your wings on the way down. There's been times when we said yes to something that we didn't have a clue what it was. What was just like, yeah, we'll do it. And then the customer thinks, well, man, it's going to be so great. And it turns out to be great, but can't tell you how long it took me to figure it out and didn't have a clue. But sometimes you just, you just got to go with it and see where it takes you. That's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Bo, do you got any uh, last questions for Tyson and Tam? Uh, I just, for, I just have a little bit too, uh, I, I had a donut question for you, but um, so I thought you guys were actually based out of Austin originally. So I was going to ask you a question of Voodoo Donuts or Gordo's uh, Donuts, but you guys probably don't know who those are. Um, but I will ask you one. Are you a baseball or football guy growing up? Both. Yeah. Okay. So then my one question, I'm going to completely judge you off this. U- UT or A&M? I'm an Oklahoma fan. Oh, no. Oh, curveball. Oh, curveball man. at you. Broke my heart. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, all, all my family's from up there. And so growing up, I was kind of just stuck in. Yeah. Um, no that's it. I mean – I don't, I don't know how you could like AM, but I picked UT. No. In <laughs> UT. Major, Major Apple White was my quarterback growing up. But man, Tyson, appreciate you, Tana. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for being on. Anytime you want to, want to do it again, I'll, uh, I'll be more than happy to. And then let me know uh, how we can share it and what we need to do on our end, and we can post it up. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate having uh, you guys on. And Bo, thanks for uh, guest hosting with us. Um, It's been a blast. Um, I'll send you the link when it's all done. You guys can approve it and we'll share it and we'll go from there. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Felix. Thanks, Felix. Thanks, Felix. Good to meet you, Bo. Nice Nice to meet you as well. We'll talk to you later. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. You too. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, guys, that wraps us up. That was a lot of fun. We talked about so many cool things from putters to uh, obviously Texas. And hopefully with this interview, we can help Bo get a uh, putter sooner than later. So make sure you subscribe, share this with as many people as possible. If you think this is cool, just hit that share button. That share helps us so much. Um, Subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're trying to build as many subscribers as we can just to share our love for uh, the golf golf and the golf community. So thanks again for all of your support. Make sure you uh, support your own local golf community, whether you're buying some stuff in the pro shop, going for a round or getting a lesson. Um, Thanks again. We appreciate all your support and we'll check in with you next time.